Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, bad, and back with another Frequently Asked Questions. And this one's rather good because we're giving away, yes, a free, nada, doesn't cost anything, nicked, a completely free plugin from Pulsar called The Smasher. So some of you may know the company Pulsar. They have a couple of lovely plugins already. One called the Echo Rec, which we will review soon, and the other one, a Mew, both of which are rather wonderful and had some rather good reviews from lots of our members. But this is special because this is the Smasher. The Smasher, you may recognize as looking a little bit like a thing with a blue stripe on it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna download it for free. This is an exclusive for one week the Produce Like a Pro audience will download this plugin for free. Thank you ever so much, Pulsar, for letting us do this. There are no strings attached. You just sign up for it and get it for free. Okay, so let us download the plugin. There will be a link. I'm actually gone straight to it here. I'm gonna put in Pulsar. You'll have a link probably to, directly to it. I see we have the Smasher for zero dollars, so free. The Echorec and the Pulsar Mew. But let's go to the Smasher. Okay, so Pulsar Smashable, free until March 11th, 2020. It says, a straightforward extreme compressor modeled after the British mode of a uniquely modified 1176 compressor. Between saturation and compression, the texture of the Smasher is unique, inimitable, and it doesn't work everywhere. But if it works, go for it generously. It's a little bit more blurb here. A custom mod on a classic circuit. Pulsar Smasher is an unprecedented custom modification of the 1176 compressor circuit we stumbled upon while fine-tuning other algorithms. Wonderful. Ah, oh, here we go. How does it sound unique? Add thickness and grip. Why it's unique. On a snare drum, on a drum bus, on a bass, on lead vocals. <laughs> I know that. Don't try this at home. Okay, so I'm going to scroll up to the top. I'm going to choose my operating system, which is, yes, a Mac. Hit. Add to cart, proceed to checkout. So I've entered all the info here. It says, thank you, your order has been received. Okay, so I've got the code here. I've highlighted it, copied it. I'm gonna download the Smasher for Mac here. So I don't have to wait for an email confirmation. I can download it straight away. Okay, let's get started. Here I have up a session, Good Loving, by Robert John and The Wreck. This is a drum mix we did entirely in the box. And let's give it a listen. So that's the drum mix we've already done. And I have two drum buses going on here. And one is just a straightforward drum bus. And the other one below here is a parallel. Put the two together. So for just for schnitz and schniggles, I'm gonna to go to the parallel and I'm gonna grab the Smasher. You recognize it. I like the basic instructions that come up here. So we've got the bypass. It says enables and disables the plugin. Ah, oh, here's the function we all love. Not everybody's done this yet, but this is beautiful, the resizing. It's a really gorgeous looking plugin. Look at all of that electronics you can see in there. They've really gone out of their way to make it look good and it's free. So free and looks good. I see it, it can go to a maximum of 200%. Wow. So look up to the right here and you will see all of the descriptions. So bypass obviously enables or disables the plugin. Input, gain controls the amount of saturation and compression. Hold the shift to link the, oh, the, with the output knob. That's a good idea. So if I do this, oh yeah, there it is. Woo that's rather nifty. I'm going to set these back. Now, if any of you know this style of compressor, it just says 1176. <coughs> Excuse me. What? Huh? Who said that? It's a fixed threshold compressor, meaning there's the threshold, the gain turns up, and as you turn up the input gain, yes, more compression is applied. We have an input and an output, and we have a mix control. Oh, so I imagine what they're doing as they turn it up it's actually changing the ratio. That's quite, so parallel squash. Yeah, this is, uh, this is rather nice. So, uh, okay. So it's got 
So it defaults to that. Limit and saturate, parallel scroll, thick it up. All right, I'm just gonna go with this default and see what we've got. It's pretty awesome. Mix control. Blend back in with the original. Mute. For a smasher, it's smashing. Pretty darn smashing. Okay, I love it so far. Best thing about it, it's free. Okay, let's try it on some bass. So what's fantastic is it's defaulting, it's giving you tons of parallel compression that I can then blend back in. Even just that small amount is great. It's pretty amazing. So it's effectively off. I can see this is gonna get used a lot just in general for a quick tool to bring some parallel energy in. We talk a lot about trying to create some random. This is gonna be really good at doing that. Okay, let's have a listen to this guitar part. Go to this one. I can see me using this all over the place for energy parts on guitars. Like if I take, let's just pull this down here on just this top one here, have a listen. Pretty, pretty freaking awesome, just adding energy in. Now I think what might be really, really nice is to try it on a parallel bus just on a snare. You know what, let's just take the live snare parts. This is what I'm gonna take here. These here. Let's have a listen to the snare. already quite disgusting, which I like. I'm not gonna duplicate that bus. I'm gonna get rid of the plugin that's already on there. Grab the smasher. And just have a listen to that. Just making it dumb and simple and idiot proof for idiots like me. Take it down. Now it's just all energy and excitement. I mean that over the top parallel energy swooshing, chaos. It's kind of cool. That's the parallel smasher, drum bus. It's just wrong in all the right ways and it's free and I love it. 
So thank you ever so much, Pulsar, for letting us have this. Yeah, let's do some parallel on that after the reverb. Why the heck not? Oh yeah, now we're talking. Take it off. Back on. This could be dangerous. This plugin could be on pretty much every mix. There's, there's certain like plugins, you know I love the MJUC, which is down there, which is super cheap. But this is free. And it's just simple, really well laid out. Any idiot, me included, can make it sound good. Did I, did I mention it's free? It's just wrong energy, just swashing all over the place. Absolutely freaking love it. Great work. So don't forget to go to the link, download it for free. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you ever so much, Pulsar, for giving us a one week exclusive on this for free. I really appreciate it. So let's get on with some frequently asked questions. What acoustic guitars would you recommend that sit well in a pop rock mix? I'm a bass player myself and from countless advice and later from experience have found that the Fender P bass will almost always sit well in the mix. Occasionally I need to record an acoustic guitar and now I'm using a plug-in to model an acoustic sound. Hmm, <laughs> which I really don't like. I totally understand. I decided to get a real one, but as most of us, I can't try recording every guitar to find out which one, especially if I'm looking to buy used, and opinions on the internet are all over the place. What are your favorite brands and models? Thank you. If you followed me for any period of time, you'll notice there's a couple of guitars I always go back to. When you're talking about pop rock, this is the one for me. I have been using this ever since it came out. I think it's about four or five years now we've had this. This is a Yamaha LL16. I've used this on countless albums and it is becoming very, very popular worldwide. Last time I was in Nashville, everybody seemed to have Yamaha acoustics. The strings are fairly old, I do need to change them, so I apologize. <laughs> It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a really, really well-made guitar. I believe it's solid top, and the thing about it is last time I checked, it was about eight or $900 new. So if you are looking for it used, it's a, I'm sure you can get it at a better deal still, but it is a really, really beautifully well-made. Absolutely love this guitar. And it records beautifully. One of the places I like to record, of course, is down here, low down, but also I can record between the 12th and 14th fret. Well, that's with a large diaphragm, a small diaphragm down here. Particularly good for arpeggios if you're doing... Just really, really fantastic. The LL16 is a gorgeous guitar. Now, if you want to go a little bit more quirky, you've seen the other guitar that I recommend all the time is a Scott Baxendale guitar. Scott is a master craftsman and, you know, a luthier. And what he did, he told me the story that his son came out of the military, I believe, hopefully I've got this right, Scott, and said, Dad, I want to learn your trade as a luthier. So he thought, well, how can I fast track and teach my son how to build guitars. So what they did is they found old silver tones, in this case, a Stella Harmony, and took them apart and rebuilt them. So he takes them apart and he puts brand new struts in them. Because if you've seen the old silver tones and harmonies, the struts are like this thick, for real. They're like about an inch or three quarters of an inch thick. And so even though it's a solid top, it tends to sound really super dead. So he, pulls them apart, restruts them, puts brand new bridges on them, shaves down the neck, refrets them, um, straightens the neck obviously, puts brand new machine heads on them and turns them into really distinctive individual. They play beautifully. But everyone is an individual masterpiece because it's a 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe early 70s guitar that has been rebuilt to a really high spec. And they come in at about $1,000 or so. So you can go to his site. He calls these backless, Baxendale's, he calls them the Harmony Conversion Baxendale guitars. Now, obviously, 
used Yamahas, if you want to go used, are a really good way to go. Everybody knows that secret. It's quite popular now. Everybody's very, very aware that a 70s Yamaha you might get online for like two or $300 is going to sound, put brand new strings on it. Absolutely gorgeous. It's a open secret now that is the best possible way to get bang for your buck on acoustic guitar. So go and look at the FG series, some of the older ones, like get to the two, 300 kind of level. You know, that's the, that's the numbers, the FG 200-ish. I think I had a 180 somewhere, which sounds phenomenal from the 70s. And they are so well made. They're made in Japan. They're beautiful. And I've seen them from like $150, $200 to about four or $500. Either way, you are going to get a beautifully made guitar that's like 30 years old and sounds phenomenal. That's my personal open secret with uh, recording acoustic guitars. I can tell you many, many I'll say many, 50 times, many times I've pulled out my 70s FG series, it's an FG 200, my 70s Yamaha, and put it up against Martins, Gibsons, Guilds, beautiful guitars. Stuck a small diaphragm condenser on the lower part of the body, Everybody has recorded with them and come into the control room and listen compared with the two, three, four thousand dollar guitars and been like, wow, that records so well. It's like I said, it's it's not quite a secret because Elliot Smith, obviously an incredibly famous acoustic guitar singer, recorded with, yes, you guessed it, 70s Yamaha acoustic guitars. And I remember having a very good conversation with Larry Crane about this, who recorded early at Elliot Smith, and he said that was a big part of the sound, that unique acoustic. So, open secret, either a used 70s or Yamaha, a new 70s Yamaha, but if you want something super, super, super charismatic, check out Baxendale guitars. I talk about these guitars because we use them every single day. That's it. Those are the guitars that we use. We record albums, uh, singles, you name it, and these are our acoustic guitars that we track. Do you mix using the small iLoud monitors? Yes, we do mix, but I don't use them to reference super, super low end because if you look behind me, I've got beautiful Focals, Genelec 1032s, and the Cali. So I've got six, eight, I've got all kinds, 10 inch speakers. I mean, there's a lot going on there, so I have a lot of choice. Focals in particular have such an extended low end. The Genelex, I've been using since the mid 90s, so I know them so well. So the iLouds serve a very specific purpose. We can monitor through them when we're sitting here. So if we don't want to be blasted in our left ear, they can be here by the monitor. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is because they're a little hyped on the high end in a fairly pleasing way, they're really good for checking pops and clicks. Obviously, headphones can also serve that purpose as well, but they're great when editing. You can take a drum track that you've edited and play it back at a relatively low level and not blow your head off, and that little tiny high hype they've got, which is not excessive, but just enough, those little clicks, those pops, maybe a bad edit, maybe a fade that doesn't sound good, the eyelows are perfect for that. But our good friend Graham Coxon has been mixing music for film and TV, and it is incredibly successful on it, and he mixes using the iLoud. So, we know it can be done. All the skill is all in your ears, and if you're used to them, I would highly suggest it. We are gonna try the next size up. They will be coming soon. I'm sure we'll do a giveaway and a review and all that stuff, so stay tuned for the i the bigger iLoud speaker review coming soon. What is your approach to miking a tambourine? Just placing a large or small diaphragm condenser 50 centimeters away from it gave me a very sterile, lifeless sound. What would you do? I have experimented with tambourine recordings over the years. Um, I have found two things that work for me. Drummer playing tambourine standing up over his drum kit uses an overhead. So here's overhead, overhead up here. They just stand up or sometimes I've even sit down underneath the overhead above the snare and just play tambourine. That works really, really well. And all you do is you just go up, you know, isolate one of those overheads that it's close to and just grab the tambourine. Sometimes they'll stand up and get a little bit closer, but ultimately that works. So the microphone is pointing down and the tambourine's underneath. That works. The other one that works and I end up doing quite a lot is vocal mic placement. Think about it, here's the vocal mic here. And think about the classic days of Motown and soul music, you know, from Stax, all these incredible records. Who was playing tambourine and percussion quite often? 
the background singers. I, I learned this with working with Dave Sardi a few years ago. He was talking about it. He said he doesn't like getting tambourine from the drummer because he said that sometimes it's like too perfect and just doesn't have a groove, have a bit of push and pull against the drummer because the drummer will play so well in time. Well, you would hope in time with himself. He said, I like singers background and lead singers to play tambourine. And when I asked why, he said, because of Motown, because the background singers might be going whoop, whoop, and at the same time, they're holding a tambourine. So it's whoop, whoop. And so I've had good success just walking up to a vocal mic and just playing it around about here. Is it perfectly pointed? No, but it starts to sound like what tambourine is supposed to sound like to me. So I would try either, try mic pointed down, imagining a drummer underneath an overhead so the mic is pointing down, and then just think about, well, if I was singing and I moved a couple of feet back, say here, and I had a tambourine playing, how would that sound? Try both of those because they're things that we are used to hearing. They are the way tambourines have been recorded in so many records that you love. And remember, that is a big part of it. I think about that when it comes to snare drums, for instance. I can't name how many times I've said to a drummer, wow, I love your snare. And then I've walked up on the stage and I look down and they're playing a Ludwig Supraphonic. 90% of the time it's a Supraphonic. The other 10% of the time, it's a Black Beauty. You get my point. It's the sound of rock and roll been so many albums that I grew up with that we all grew up with and, and still go back and reference from the 60s and the 70s in particular that we're using Ludwig either Superphonics or Black Beauties. And that becomes a, the sound of a snare that we're so familiar with and we love so much that when a drummer uses one, we're like, oh, that's a great sounding snare. And of course there are many, many other great sounding snares. But my point is it's like a baseline. It's like a standard, like, okay, a Superphonic with brand new heads on it is crisp and beautiful and could be tuned in so many different ways. A Black Beauty with a brand new heads on it, it's just got a bite to it with a beautiful ring from that beautiful, brass shell. I mean, it is just a thing of beauty. You're always gonna get great results out of a drum like that. Now, of course, there's plenty of other alternatives. My point is, is that familiarity is what we start to love. If you hear a drum sound you love, you hear a tambourine recorded in the way that you are used to hearing it, it will make you feel warm and fuzzy and like, oh, that reminds me of classic Motown. So that's the reason why I like this information I've learned and this, the power that you get from this acquired knowledge means that you can get a result that sounds pretty authentic. I'm sure there's very, you could put stereo miking in a dead room and do all kinds of clever over the top things to record a tambourine, but microphone pointed down as an overhead or positioned like a vocal mic is the things that we're used to hearing. So I would start with recording them like that. Absolutely wonderful. Don't forget to download the free plugin, the Smasher. Thank you ever so much Pulsar for letting us play with that. I'm certainly gonna be using it a lot. Just those few minutes of me messing around just gave me some really fun results. Please try it. Please download it for free. Thank you ever so much for all the wonderful questions. There is going to be a link below to download the plugin. Please subscribe, go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list, and leave a whole bunch of comments and questions below. Remember, this is where we get our frequently asked questions. So have a marvelous time recording and mixing, and we'll see you all again very, very soon. Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs>